Not a place I have to hide in. Life's not worth a damn till you can say, I am what I am. I'm joined down here at the exhibition in Stevens Green Centre, which, as you can see, is fabulous, with our uh, long standing friend Eddie McGuinness. But, Eddie, before we talk about what's happening down here, you need to just talk to me about yourself. You've been in the wars a bit, uh, so can you just give people an update without being too personal? No, it's it's okay. It's as I put it, I've had a personal journey. I have been suffering with, uh, in a way, going through treatment for cancer, uh, throat cancer and esophagus cancer, and it's been low and high moments. But most importantly. It has been the love of our own LGBT plus community and family, and especially my husband, has actually got me through it. Uh, because I was many a stage for oh, near two months, I couldn't even speak, talk. A lot of people said that could be a, a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Uh, my Dundalk accent, but I think the Dundalk accent has come back a wee bit. But again, like anything else, that has been uh, uh, not only dealing with COVID over the last. In there, we're going on near two years or whatever, but then to get cancer on top of that has been really yes. Well, it's uh, it, it seems like tragedy has befallen you because the last time you and I were at a, an opening of a Pride uh, um, uh, festival was 2019 down in the GPO, and that was the anniversary of your mother, I think, as well. So yeah, so unfortunately, like, yeah. The, the, actually, this weekend uh, my mum would be three years passed away. Uh, and in a way, uh, she, she and my two nephews have given me that spiritual uh, love and strength and also my other friends, uh, and I'm not afraid, Derek, uh, Taxi Man Derek, like most people would remember, and uh, Sean Meehan. I've all been there in the background and others yeah. who have given me that spiritual strength because I, I, I very much, I, I know that I have my spiritual love as well yeah. uh, out there. Well, uh, I only discovered, uh, as a lot of people did on social media, because we can't catch up with each other, and I thought, oh, this is this is tragic. But looking at you now, and I've seen people who've had throat cancer over the last couple of years, you're as good as they are. Uh, so what, what, the spirit is still very strong there, Eddie. The spirit has been the spirit of everyone else around me, as I say. I wasn't afraid uh, while I was doing stuff. Uh, to, to know I'm going to go to my lowest point uh, in my life uh, and at the same time but I knew that the strength of everyone around especially my husband because I knew I had to lean on him for to get me through it and everyone else supported him and gave him the leg up and John I can't say enough I love him so much uh, but has also given us another dimension to our relationship of that, that passion of who and what we are probably brought home to you because I've been talking to our uh, mutual friend Shiv Conley about just how much family the LGBT community is. Has that, uh, has that resonated with you? And I think well, most importantly going forward uh, as individuals, in a way so a lot of people don't have that family at home. Mm -hmm. Uh, because unfortunately they don't expect, accept who they are. Mm -hmm. But growing up, in, especially within the gay scene, or the LGBT plus, Q plus uh, scene, we find our own little families and friends, mm -hmm. and they become lifelong family and friends. Mm -hmm. And that is something that, uh, which is cherishable uh, within a community. Mm -hmm. And our, our community is very diverse, mm -hmm. and we know that. And we might not all agree or disagree in yeah. different areas, but the difference is, under the rainbow, no matter what stripes and what other flags come in on top of it, we actually realise going forward is we are a family yeah. and we care about each other. Well, even taking it slightly wider, I think I was walking down the Keys on uh, Friday, first time I've been in town for quite a long time, and I saw all these rainbow flags and the new flag as well. Yeah. That, uh, uh, which meant, and I was saying to people, this just shows how LGBTQ plus welcoming Dublin is. We are, you know, that, that has resonated now with the rest of the world and it's, 
you know, it's certainly a tribute to people like yourself who put in so much. Well, the, it's a passion and love for what we who and what we are, mm -hmm. including yourself, Mick. Yeah. You know yourself. We keep going. Uh, even though we don't look for uh, economic value of it, we actually more social value of what uh, what we actually do. And even this week alone, uh, Dublin City Council, we've been working with them for a good few years about getting rainbow crossings in our city, and we, they've actually passed a motion. But that was all councillors coming together to sure. say yes. And that is better, everyone working together rather than against each other. And I think that's what we really need to look forward to in a, in a city that is not just Dublin, mm -hmm. but also about reaches out to our, uh, I'm a good country boy and I will never take away my country uh, origin. We, that allows us to reach out to our country brothers and sisters, families, non-binaries out there to say who we are. Come on, let's all work together. Let's talk together. Indeed. It's funny you should mention that because in the last couple of weeks, or well, in the last couple of months, I've been doing things with the rural centres. We love it now that we are prepared to. It's not Dublin centric, you know. Yes. This, this is a national event, whether it's Cork, Galway, Belfast, Limerick. Uh, this is a national event. Yeah. Eddie, uh, I'm not going to hold you up too much because I know you're hugely busy. Just a couple of things. We all miss the parade, uh, but you, uh, again, to all the volunteers and all the people involved in Pride, it's a tribute that there is, the, the energy is still there. And one of the, uh, the great uh, events this year is what's here today. This is an exhibition up in the um, uh, Stevens Green Centre. Just very briefly talk us through this. We seem to be mainly in a room that's devoted to Tom McGinty, the, uh, the, uh, the legendary dice man. So just uh, tell us about this uh, and all the fabulous costumes here. Here at State, the top floor in Stevens Green Shopping Centre is one of multiple uh, creative uh, exhibitions that we have going on, like Out in the World in the Epic Centre. Also we have the uh, AIDS Quilt, which is now on show till the end of June in CHQ. There we also have the photographic exhibition uh, by the National Library in the por Portrait, uh, photographic uh, in Temple Bar. But also here in Stevens Green, we look at this here, I had the pleasure of, this is the original bodice yeah. of uh, Tom McGinty, yeah. but also I had the pleasure of recreating the backpack, and I've worn many a backpack like this over yeah. the years at Pride. Mm -hmm. But uh, Tom was arrested wearing this, and was told that he was showing too much flesh uh, yeah. on the street. <laughs> but Tom McGinty was known as the Dice Man. He was the spirit of what Dublin City was all yeah. about. He walked in the most outrageous costumes, yeah. but in a way, it was his creativity. I had the pleasure of working, uh, getting workshops in the early 90s yeah. from him around mime as a former uh, dancer and choreographer. So standing in the room, I could feel the passion and love of what this is and in a way is immerse what you want and as the exhibition also will show it there will be a piece of the AIDS quilt here there's also a photographic exhibition uh, with from Babs from GCN and Enda aka uh, Veda uh, about her uh, photographic uptake of what COVID meant to, uh, for, for them sure. and then also is we have an exhibition of all uh, our former Grand Marshals mm -hmm. as well as we take you around the place. So there's lots to be in store sure. for here in Pride but also around the city our Pride Hub on Duke Street and there'll be a lot more. Yeah. And it, Pride is not just for Pride month of June, yeah. it's throughout our, Ireland going throughout the, the whole time. But also, we are 365 days a year Indeed. of who we are. Yeah. So why just celebrate for one month? Let's the rainbow fly 24 yeah. seven. And just last, but by no means least, we've also got down in the National Library, the Queer Archives, which is yes. fabulous as well. And, uh, yes. uh, and coincidentally, because they're usually separate events, we've got the, uh, the uh, theatre festival, the, the Gay Theatre Festival as well. So look, Dublin's the place to be in June, is it not? Well, Dublin's in June and July. In June and July and going forward it is, but it's not even just about Dublin. Mm -hmm. As a country boy, we love coming to the big smoke yeah. uh, and expressing who we are. Now take that expression as you find yourself yeah. and go back to where you could have come from and be who you are. And that's what Ireland is all about. Yeah. North, South, East and West. Let's bring it all together and let us all shine a rainbow.
perhaps we might just say that a message to our, our brothers and sisters in Budapest and Hungary. If you don't like it over there, you'll always be welcome here, eh? We are all Europeans and full European members. And that is what we have to realise going forward is we all stand for the same thing and diversity and equality. The rainbow at the end of the day isn't a pot of gold yeah. and economics. The rainbow is about equality and the rainbow is about social equality and that's what, we're, what it's all about. Eddie, we just look forward to you getting better and bigger and stronger and continuing this because you've done such a fabulous job. So the passion and love is always there. That's the passion and love of here, what we are. Next year in uh, Marion Square, Lee. And thank you for all the love. Take care. I'm also now joined by uh, Andrew Deering, who's involved with uh, Dublin Pride. So, Andrew, first of all, could you just tell uh, our uh, listeners, how did you come to be involved in an uh, exhibition? So I was approached by uh, a friend of mine, uh, Christelle, who um, has been working with Dublin Pride since last um, October, November. And uh, she told me that there was an opening um, for an exhibition curator. Um, for Dublin Pride and so uh, then it came together from that and different artists uh, were approached and different ideas were put together and then we came up with an idea of four discrete but complementary elements and those are the Diceman uh, exhibit, um, Colin Malloy's um, graphic design on colonial erasure, uh, Veda Lady and Bab Staley a series of portraits and then also a series of illustrations uh, of the roots and some key figures who took part in Dublin Pride over the last uh, 40 years. In lieu of the parade, because there's no parade this year again, um, the idea was to recreate or to tell the story of Pride uh, through its history, through illustrations and hmm. maps. The room we're in now, Andrew, it looks very much to me like um, homage to uh, Tom McGinty, yeah. uh, who everybody would, uh, well, for people of uh, a certain generation would know as the Dice Man. Is that um, um, a reasonable uh, uh, conclusion? I think so. I think so. I mean, certainly speaking for myself, my first awareness of, of Tom McGinty, the Dice Man, was uh, when he died, yeah. because um, I was maybe 12 or 13, and I remember it vividly. It was quite unusual, uh -huh. but I, I recall that RTE um, on the news uh, they had footage of the, of the funeral, yeah. uh, which came down, which processed down Grafton Street, uh, which is, of course, synonymous with Tom. And so over the years, I have come to know him better. But yes, a lot of people are finding out who he is. And there's mm. been a lot of good work on um, re-establishing uh, Tom or introducing him uh, to a new generation. Yeah. Tom was a... Um Street entertainer is what we would call him. He'd have to have a license these days from the yes. city council. But it's interesting. I don't know. While we have various people doing, you know, various, um, shall we say, living statues and things like that, mm. I, I don't know anybody else since Tom McGinty or since the yeah. Dice Man who's performed an equivalent act. And I just. Uh, um, it's a bit of a loss really for Dublin, isn't it? I agree. I think um, it's maybe changing values or changing yeah. times, partly. Yeah. Um, but also it is, as you say, the idea about licences and perhaps the fact yeah. that the city is busier yeah. than it used to be. And um, I suppose Tom was a street entertainer, but he was so much more than that as well. Sure. He had you know, the background in theatre. He had worked with uh, Lindsay Kemp yeah. in the UK. And so... He was a man of many parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, start over here, um, Andrew. Uh, we wanted, uh, you know, if, if you could perhaps just talk to people through. First of all, where did you get some of these costumes? So the Diceman Living Visuals um, is made up of uh, three of uh, Tom's closest friends: uh, Susie Kennedy, Aidan Murphy, and the artist Michael D. And uh, what they've done over the years is they have preserved, they have kept the costumes, and they have kept a lot of the props, the hats he wore, the mm -hmm. different items that are associated with him. And so um, that is the source of the material. And then we're also quite fortunate in the sense that last year, the Little Museum of Dublin, in collaboration with the Diceman Living Visuals, staged an exhibition. Mm -hmm. And we're very grateful to the museum because they have... Uh, it has lent us some of the materials sure. from last year's exhibition. But the actual costumes um, are um, kept by Aidan, 
Um, this cape here uh, was part of a costume that Tom wore. I'm not quite sure what it advertised, mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you that this one here, the Basque and um, the feathers, this uh, was promotional material for a live production of the Rocky Horror Picture Show okay. um, in the early 1990s. And this was quite controversial uh, because if you see here behind you get a, a, an image of the reverse of the costume uh, because Tom wore the Basque and then his bottom half was a thong and then fishnet tights and high heel shoes. So in fact he was arrested uh, for this for uh, Offences to as, as a stage for doing a stage production, or was he? Uh, uh, no, was no. It, was so to, um, uh, he was he was processing up and down Grafton Street dressed um, in this way, uh, but he was promoting the live show sure. of, of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, mm -hmm. and so um, he was arrested for offences to public decency, and he famously said. Uh, once he was arrested, well, I'm in my working clothes. That was his uh, rebuttal. So fair and technically true, yeah. uh, but it cut no dice. Yeah. Can we have a look at the one behind you? Because yes. it looks, uh, it's a strange one in one sense, because it doesn't look <clears throat> a million miles from what you would see if you went to Morocco, taking yeah. away the uh, the Star of David. So what's yeah. that? Uh, what's the story behind that one, Andrew? Uh, this one was also um, something that he walked uh, down the street in, and again, I'm not sure what it advertised. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of his costumes were made by two people, uh, Kathy Kavanagh and Aidan Bradley, and mm. so they would have. Um, have had access to what Tom was yeah. was was going for, but in in the main, a lot of these costumes. Yeah, there's quite a mystical quality it about does, it, doesn't it? Absolutely it absolutely does. Yeah, and they yeah. were designed for a particular um, mm. shop or premises or yeah. business. Let's have a look at the one over here because yeah. uh, this is not a million miles away from a, a shirt I have, uh, Andrew. So if you could perhaps stand over beside yes, it. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. And I tell you, the shirt that I've got is a Versace, um, right. and the colours there could almost be taken from it. So uh, somebody had a great eye for colour, and so uh, d clearly... Um, yeah. Well, this one, we're kind of cheating because this is actually two separate ones that we put together. Yeah. Uh, the costume itself is, as you can see, a jester costume. So again, this was something yeah. uh, that was designed for him. And then the balloon structure, so as you can see, it was worn on straps on the shoulder. And with this went a stovepipe hat, yeah. a very tall top hat. Mm -hmm. And this was again advertising um, a, b a balloon fair. Or a sure. Yeah. Yeah. He was he was a great stylist, was Tom. Well, wasn't this he? is it. It, it was um, it, the costumes were one thing, but it was the whole package. It was everything that went with it, and the makeup in a lot of cases as well. It, it really told a story. Sure. Yeah. Now we have a. Uh, uh, I'd almost call it a smock to a certain degree. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a, I'm colour blind, but it looks like red and yellow to me. It is. It is and, geometric uh, and shapes. It's got yeah. some geometric patterns. Squares, circles, triangles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another idea uh, from the costume designer with Tom, and um, designed again to yeah. to parade around him. Yeah. Sure. What time are we talking about? Because these seem to be timeless in the sense that they're yeah. you could wear them now and they would look very up to. Uh, <coughs> Up to the mark. Well, it? it's true. Well, Tom was originally from Scotland, from Indeed. a place called Glenboyg yeah. in Scotland, and he came to Ireland in the 1970s. And um, he initially started out in um, theatre. So, as I said, he trained with Lindsay Kemp. He mm. trained in mime artistry, and um, that where that is where a lot of his movement training mm -hmm. uh, kicked in. Because when he started uh, on Grafton Street, or when he started advertising things, there was a bylaw. Um, in Dublin City Council at the time is that one couldn't remain stationary yeah. because then you attracted crowds and it mm. was a hazard. And so that's why he started to move very slowly. You'd have to walk him, watch him like a hawk. And so that's where these kind of costumes came into their own because they were very colourful. Um, some of them were, let's say, safer than others because, for example, when he was in the Basque, that obviously would um, attract a lot of attention. Sure. And sometimes he would have things thrown at him, he would be pinched in the bottom or other parts of the body. Yeah. And that's where Aidan Murphy, uh, who is in the Dyson uh, Living Visuals Collective, he then became his minder okay. and looked after him. Mm -hmm. So he would be able to wear things like this in peace. Yeah. 
We should point out that somebody else who trained with Lindsay Kemp, well, apart from the great Lee Bowery, was yeah. David Bowie. And uh, there's right. a very Bowie-esque yes. quality about yes. these costumes, isn't there? That's, a very, that's a very good point. It's a definite trajectory of, um, you know, using stillness and using what he called, I think he called it the imaginary being or the imagining. Sure. So those two elements uh, he did very well. And of course, his training when he came to Ireland in the 70s, he, he had a theatre company for a while. And so we have that background as well. He was also in a production of Salome at the Gate Theatre mm -hmm. um, in the late 1980s, 88, I think. Yeah. And so um, in that, he, that was a completely wordless performance, which mirrored yeah. uh, his work in the public domain, because he rarely, if ever, uh, spoke. And in fact, it was um, his facial expressions yeah. which were... Well, Lindsay well, Kemp was wings. primarily a barn artist, was he not? Yeah, precisely. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Can I have a look at the one behind you now, yes. Andrew, which is again... Yeah. Uh, it's almost like a sculptor in fabric, isn't it? It is, it is, it is. So this is a very much an uh, oriental, um, eastern feel to it. I think, in fact, it may have had, at some point, the letters Japan written on either circle here. Mm -hmm. So this was, I'm, again, I'm not sure precisely what it was advertising, but it was something um, yeah. to do with Japanology. But yes, it's it's kind of um, giving a little bit of uh, tunic and kimono, kimono yeah. as well. Very good. It, it, it could almost be part kabuki, couldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it has yeah. that style about it. Now, you're beside a suit uh, here, Andrew, and uh, you have a look at this one here, and you could you could almost see Dave, a, the younger David Bowie in it, could yes. you not? Isn't yeah. it? Uh, yeah. it's a, well, it's, it's quite a simple idea. It's quite a simple design. Yeah. It's it's um, you know the cut on the bias here and yeah. uh, the buttons, uh, but it's really the the jockey feel to it. The kind of the, mm -hmm. the different patterns of colours, the colours running through it, and um, again a great sense of fun and colour, which is what Tom was renowned mm -hmm. for. Yeah. You've got two uh, quite different uh, pieces coming up here, uh, yeah. Andrew. A very colourful suit, which could almost have a matador quality. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, the interesting thing about these is that these were actually uh, the two of them. So, yeah, the, the it's, you know, it's quite simple. Uh -huh. um, nice. And then the one over here, uh, the boiler suit, these were essentially rompers. They were kind of for everyday wear. Uh, so there was nothing terribly fancy about these. This one looks quite trivial. Yeah. Um, but these were actually for, for casual wear. Yeah. Uh, so these weren't for when he was uh, yeah. in his working clothes. I mean, you might consider that uh, nothing fancy, but I think there's a lot... <laughs> I'll put it to you this way, uh, Andrew. If you and I were to walk down Grafton yeah. Street in the next five minutes in that suit, uh, we get noticed. That's Absolutely. all I can say. Well, and, this is it. and it's all relative, and I guess that the point is that Tom, if Tom considered this uh, casual wear, that, that says a lot about the kind of person. Absolutely, he was. yeah. No, this, now, was this is so simple, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it could well be a tribute to somebody's working class origins. Yes, and the interesting about this thing about this is that it was specially made for him, yeah. and um, it wasn't not that one wants to be vulgar about it, but it wasn't. It kind of looks quite plain, and is yeah. um, when you look at, look at it from a distance quite plain. But it wasn't it wasn't cheap. Yeah. In other words, there's quite a lot of fabric in here, yeah. and at the time, I think it was upwards of 100, 200 pounds to make this. Yeah. Um, but it's again showing the attention to detail, the style that Tom had, and the fact that he considered this day wear. This sure. was his romper, this yeah. was his border suit. That looks quite... I, now, again, because I wasn't in... I left Dublin in the early 70s, so I wasn't here for most of the time Tom was here, and I didn't come back to him about the mid-90s, so... Yeah. But I always considered, just looking at the photographs, that Tom was quite a, a tall, slender man. But if you yes. have a look at these uh, costumes, yeah. Yeah. or at least the suits, yeah. it suggests that he was probably about 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, five, I think he might have been over the six feet mark. But only yeah, he always looked yeah. tall to me. Yeah, and of course he was, he was very slim as well. So, yeah. um, as we've been joking about these when we put them on, you know, the mannequins are, yeah. are, are he, was up, he was clearly bigger than the mannequins. He was what we would call a, uh, a slim hip prover. <laughs> or even as Bowie would call it, a thin white duke. <laughs> Precisely. Couldn't have put it better myself. Yeah. The final piece in the collection, we've got a stovepipe hat here and perhaps something that looks like it could be a magician's uh, or, uh, or even a... Uh, um, a, a ringmaster's outfit. Yes, yes. We don't have all of the costume of this, so we have the tails. Uh -huh. uh, but underneath this, there was a waistcoat, 
uh, also with uh, heart-shaped buttons and then white trousers. So it's very much, as you say, yes, a, a circus ringmaster or you know a, a, a host of some sort. But mm -hmm. this was designed for St Valentine's Day. This was mm -hmm. uh, advertising, um, I think, a particular uh, St Valentine's Day, and he wore this. Um, quite often, and he's photographed in it not long before he died yeah. uh, in 1995. Very, very sad, very sad. Andrew, I'm going to recommend that people uh, come up and see this because it's part of the LGBTQ plus legacy. Yes. Um, how long is the exhibition going on for? So the exhibition will run uh, into mid-July. Uh -huh. um, at the moment it's the 16th of July, but there may be the possibility of extending that. Mm -hmm. And it's up here in the uh, Stephen's Green Centre on the, the top floor. The very top in Stephen's Green uh, Shopping Centre exhibition space. Mm -hmm. And it's open from 10.30 to 5.30 uh, every day. It's my world that I want to have a little pride in. My world and it's not a place I have to hide in. Life's not worth a damn till you can say I am.